The motor ensure a direct line. Plus the new generative AI model for business, which its creators claim could be the iPhone of AI. Good afternoon, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. Shares of St James's Place have fallen by as much as 32% today, hitting their lowest level in 11 years. It comes after the wealth manager set aside £426 million to make potential refunds to clients and slashed its dividend. The company admitted it had seen a significant increase in customer complaints, particularly in the latter part of 2023, linked to client service. The company, which has nearly a million customers, said it also uh, changed its fee structure last year and that meant that profits growth would be lower in coming years, hitting its ability to invest in the business. The provision meant St James's Place reported a pre-tax loss of £4.5 million for 2023, down from a profit of £503.9 million in 2022. We'll have much more on that a little later in the programme, but in the meantime, if you want to uh, hear my views on uh, this story, do have a scan of the QR code on the screen right now. That is uh, my explanation as to what's gone wrong at St James's Place. Very interesting story that touches the lives of many, many hundreds of thousands of people. Some other stories for you now. And Taylor Wimpy admitted today it will build fewer homes than it did last year. The UK's biggest house builder by stock market value said that it expects to complete between 9,500 and 10,000 homes this year, down from 10,848 in 2023 and 14,154 in 2022. Well, the news came as Taylor Wimpy reported an underlying pre-tax profit of £473.8 million for 2023. That was down 48% on 2022. Jenny Daly, the chief executive, said current trading was showing some encouraging signs of improvement, with reduced mortgage rates positively impacting affordability and confidence among customers. The shares have fallen by 2.5%. The Belgian-based insurer Aegeus said today it is considering a possible offer for the motor insurer Direct Line. Aegeus, best known in the UK for its past sponsorship of Hampshire County Cricket Club's Rose Ball Ground in Southampton, said the potential offer would value Direct Line at £3.1 billion. Direct Line has had a tumultuous 13 months since off issuing a profits warning last January that cost the former chief executive Penny James her job. Her successor, Adam Winslow, is due to start this week. Well, I can tell you in the last few moments, Direct Line has rejected that approach from Aegeus. Its shares are currently ahead by nearly 25%. And shares of Reckitt have slumped by more than 10% today after the household goods giant unexpectedly suffered a drop in sales during the final three months of last year. Reckitt, whose brands include Dettol, Harpic, Nurofen, Durex and Sillit Bang, admitted that the 1.2% reverse in like-for-like -like sales was unsatisfactory and reflected issues in two of its Middle Eastern markets, as well as the timing of the cold and flu season. The company, whose other brands include Calgon, Clearacel and Strepsils, reported a pre-tax profit of £2.4 billion for 2023. That was down 22% on 2022. A bit of uh, breaking news to uh, bring. You've just heard from the Home Office on reports of an incident in the Channel. A government spokesperson has said we can confirm there has been an incident in the Channel involving a small boat in French waters. French authorities are leading the response and investigation. We will not be commenting further at this stage. We'll have more on that for you this afternoon here on Sky News, I'm sure. Now, the last 12 months have been uncertain for a lot of commercial property companies amid concern over retail spending and questions over how much office space is required with hybrid working. But neither have been issues for primary health properties, which invests in and owns buildings such as GP surgeries that let on long leases and where most of the rent is funded directly or indirectly by government body. Well, today, it reported earnings of £90.7 million for 2023, up 2.3% 2 on 2022, and it announced a rise in the dividend for the 28th consecutive year. Well, joining me now is the founder and chief executive, Harry Hyman. Harry, good to see you again this afternoon. Um, you saw weighted average rental growth last year of 4%. What proportion of the portfolio uh, was subject to rent changes during the year? Um, roughly one third. 69% um, of the portfolio has what we call open market value increases, and 27% has um, index-linked increases. And obviously, we benefited from the higher levels of inflation 
last year, but the trend of our rental growth has been distinctly up. So two years ago, we were getting £2 million of rental growth in monetary terms. Uh, the year before last, it was £3 million, and in 23 we reported £4 million. So this is incredibly important to keeping our dividend moving forward, particularly at a time when it's been hard for us to buy a new property, given the high levels of interest rates both here and in the Eurozone. I'm <clears throat> delighted to say we did manage to buy one new property in Ireland last year, uh, Ballincollig near Cork, for just some €30 million, Euros, and that's very accretive and is going to provide good prospects for the year ahead. And we've already paid the first quarterly dividend of what we what brokers expect to be a 6.9p dividend for the current year. Harry, uh, what sort of changes are going on in the um, in the GP service model right now, and how does it affect you? Well, I think it's important to use the word primary care because in some of our centres, 80% of the staff working there, the healthcare professionals, are not actually GPs. And, and, and what this means is there's a demand for much larger core medical centres, like our property at Eastbourne and like the one I mentioned at Ballincollig. So these enhanced primary care services are keeping people out of hospital, using technology to stop people needing to go to, to, um, to hospital, uh, and also addressing the wellness debate. With so much chronic disease in, in Britain, like type 2 diabetes, um, osteoarthritis, cardi cardiac heart disease, and, and obesity, it's important that people are <clears throat> effectively trained into how, how to keep themselves better for longer. And this will ultimately reduce the net cost to the health service. So primary care, which includes GPs, obviously, is very much the word of the future. On that basis, Harry, what proportion would you say of, of the stock of uh, primary care facilities in this country are actually fit for purpose just now? Well, there have been a number of surveys. It's quite hard to get a precise figure, but something like a half are not fit for purpose, being old-style residential properties, terraced particularly in inner urban areas, semi-detached houses, converted offices. And we think as an industry, there's a requirement for some £5 billion worth of capital formation. That's all obviously not going to happen in one year. But over a three to five year period, there's adequately um, probably around a need for a thousand new medical centres in, in Britain. And it's a similar position in Ireland, obviously a different geography and a different structure. But there the HSE, the Irish equivalent of the NHS, is about halfway through its program of modernising the estate. So that brings fantastic opportunities for the sector when interest rates have gone down a bit and when it's possible for us to get the deals to work. But that will require further rental growth as well in terms of the reimbursed rent that we get from the NHS and the HSE. You've mentioned Ireland a couple of times now in this conversation, uh, Harry. What proportion of uh, capex are you diverting towards Ireland just now? Well, currently it represents 9% of our total portfolio and we have plans to grow that to 15%. Uh, obviously, Ireland is a much smaller country than the UK, but we think it's perfectly feasible to get our portfolio from its current level of around 250 million sterling up to around the 500 million pound mark. And it's important to stress that we have plenty of headroom and plenty of firepower in our balance sheet at the moment, and we have absolutely no requirement to raise new capital in order to do that. What we need is a speeding up of the process and a, a recognition by both the Irish authorities and the British authorities that higher rental levels are needed in order to kickstart this primary care investment programme. Before I let you go, Harry, this is the last time we'll be speaking to you in this capacity because you're moving from CEO to chairman. That's quite yeah. often frowned on by some investors. Have you, have you had much pushback? No, our, our, our shareholders are very supportive because as the founder and with a 28-year track record of knowledge of the business, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to being less actively involved in the day-to-day -day, but still being involved in the strategic direction of the company. And I do own quite a significant proportion of the shares, so I am well aligned with the shareholder base of the company. That doesn't happen until the 24th of April, but I'm looking forward to working with my new Chief Executive Mark Davies, who's got a very long and distinguished track record in managing FTSE 250 companies. Good stuff. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing you again many times in the future, Harry. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Ian.
Now, the US tech giant NVIDIA tends to dominate the headlines when it comes to generative AI and business. But another California-based company looking to steal a march on its rivals is Samba Nova Systems. It also makes AI chips and this afternoon is launching Samba One, a generative AI model which it claims could be the iPhone of AI. Well, joining me now to talk about this is Rodrigo Liang, the co-founder and chief executive of Samba Nova Systems. So welcome to you. This, this is complicated technology. Can you, can you explain simply what it does? Well, first, thanks for having us. Uh, we're really excited about this. Over the last six months, the world's kind of been taken by, this, by a storm with GPT-4 and these uh, incredibly powerful models. Well, today we're announcing Samba One. It's a uh, one trillion parameter model that allows enterprises to customize their own data into these models completely in their own private environments completely securely deployed so they don't have to disclose their data into public environments. So this is an integrated hard, hardware and uh, software system. What, what are the risks in delivering that? You know, the uh, systems that we have today, uh, you have to disclose these models into environments where you have to assess the risk of whether your data leaks or not. The beauty of Samba One is integrated into a fully hardware in, uh, encapsulated system that you can deploy in your own private data centers. This could be in your on-prem, this could be a private cloud, and allows you to have full control of your data wherever you want to train these models, wherever you want to deploy these models for your business processes, you can have full control on where the data goes. I mean, this is one of the issues with, with AI. A lot of it is delivered on legacy systems and on legacy uh, architecture processes. That's right. You know, as we're seeing, the cost of AI is increasing every single day. These models are getting bigger. And not just cost, the power, the energy costs, and the uh, data center costs are all increasing. And so with Samba One, we've been able to do a full stack, a true full stack, which allows us to take these very, very powerful models and optimize them on hardware so that the footprint reduces by 10x. And this is ultimately what we think is necessary for us to go into scale, where the footprint is reduced by 10x, is less cost, less power, less energy required, less data center footprint. All of these things are important as we start going into production with AI. Do you worry at all that regulators might have something to say about this? I mean, because you're effectively offering, offering customers a one-stop shop. I mean, regulators might say, well, hang on, that, that potentially hits diversity and in, in, in innovation in the sector. Well, you know, what we did with Samba One, and this is the beauty of it, we really leaned into the open source. As you know, there are so many different models out in the, uh, in, in the open community that allows us to actually open and study and be able to see what it's all about. And now that the models have gotten so good, we've been able to leverage into that and give control back to the enterprises, back to the clients, so they can see what models are they using. They can test it, they can uh, verify, certify it, and it's all in a single platform that they can do all of that certification and regulation work without having to go hunt around for their own individual models. What sort of customers are you targeting here? You know, we're looking at the largest enterprises, most governments, anywhere where you have a lot of private data, data you don't want out in, in the community, data you want to protect either because uh, it's regulated or because it's a competitive advantage. You want to protect that data. We allow you to actually be able to incorporate that into AI without having you disclose it. That sounds all well and good. What about uh, smaller businesses? I mean, some of them would love an opportunity to, to uh, take advantage of this. Yeah, we think AI is, AI is a fortune everybody uh, technology, and so we think that every company should have access to it. And one of the beauties with uh, the Samba Nova technology is we've reduced the cost of these large models by, by 10x which makes it so much more accessible, so much more possible for enterprises of all sizes to be able to come in and take advantage of this technology while you're going through this transition, as the world's going through this transition, going from a pre-AI world to post. How can you compete, though, with such a giant like NVIDIA in this, in this field? You know, NVIDIA's done a tremendous job really building up uh, uh, their business. And, and you know what this show is the tremendous demand for the technology. Right? In just a short amount of time, we've seen the company valuations go, go, go incredibly high and, and you see the continuous demand for these chips. And so for Samba Nova, we see a great opportunity for our technology that allows us to, one, give customers more choice as far as what hardware platform they want to use, but also give them a hot start to their business. Many, many companies don't have the machine learning expertise, and so we can bring in pre-trained models, pre-optimized models, so that it reduces the human cost of getting started on AI. Okay, Rodrigo, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to talk to you this Yo, afternoon. Thank you so thank much. You.
Still to come here on Business Live, we'll have a look at how the markets have done this Wednesday afternoon. Stay with us. push the protesters further back here. There's around two or 300 still remaining. I'm Dan Whitehead and I'm Sky News' West of England correspondent. This van goes onto the streets of Plymouth seven days a week, 365 days a year. These facilities at the, at the moment are, are a lifesaver. It's all, it's all we've got. From fishing communities to bustling cities, we spend every day reporting from across the region, hearing from people who have real stories. I'm going to have nowhere to live for about three or four months. There are still people inside the properties here. They're coming from the epicentre of what is now a global health pandemic. seeing and speaking to young women who were selling themselves right on the high street. It was desperately sad and the fact it was happening right in the heart of this community. Before Brexit, these oysters were being exported to the EU, but the trade stopped overnight. What's your feeling about the future then? Blake, might all be finished, I don't know. I just took a shower above the clouds. You know why? Because this is the Emirates A380. Fly Emirates, fly better. Well, European stocks have had a mixed uh, session today, it's uh, fair to say. I can show you how the main continental European indices have finished up this afternoon. I think they're all in pretty mixed territory. Any time now, here we go. Yeah, so uh, the DAX uh, up a quarter of 1%, CAC more or less unchanged, uh, MIB in Milan off a quarter of 1%, and the uh, IBEX in Madrid, the laggard there, uh, 
talking points this afternoon include Just Eat Takeaway. Uh, that's finished off 4% in Amsterdam, despite what was uh, originally uh, thought to be quite an upbeat trading statement. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 has finished in negative territory of uh, three quarters of 1%, some 58 points uh, down. Of that, 20 points alone came from Reckitt following uh, those uh, rather disappointing results there. And uh, St James's Place, that clipped another two and a half points from the FTSE following its uh, trading statement. Meanwhile, Smith & Nephew, which uh, fell on its results this time yesterday, look at that, it's off another 6% nearly this afternoon. Meanwhile, Vodafone, that was up this morning. It's in, news, it's in talks to sell its Italian arm to Swisscom for €8 billion. Euros. Shares have uh, been largely unmoved there. Had a bit of a rally yesterday when that seeped out. So the upside, well, the leading blue chip gainer, not for the first time this year, Rolls-Royce, up 3.5% uh, nearly. That's on positive broker comment. Outside the FTSE 100, Direct Line is the leading mid-cap gainer, up 23 and three-quarter percent on that takeover approach. Meanwhile, Aston Martin Lagonda is up some 4%. It had uh, results out today. Meanwhile, HICL Infrastructure had a trading update out. It's finished up by some 2.5%. To the downside, look at that. Halfords off by 27% almost following a profits warning. Over on Wall Street, all of the main stock indices have opened to the downside. The Nasdaq's currently off just over a quarter of 1%. Uh, Apple is off uh, by just over half of 1% this afternoon. And that off nearly three quarters of 1% now. That is on reports that it's pulled the plug on its electric vehicle product. Another company to mention is TJ Exco. That's the parent of the retailer TJ Maxx. That's up by, or TK Maxx as we call it here. That's up 1% uh, on a trading update. The foreign exchange markets, well, it's been a good day for the US dollar, slightly firmer ahead of tomorrow's US inflation data, sterling off by just under a sixth of 1% against the greenback, the pound also off tenth of 1% against the euro, single currency more or less unchanged right now against the dollar. As for the oil price, well, that has slipped following news of a surge in uh, US crude stocks. Out of Brent crude currently changing hands at $83.38 a barrel. That's off a little under a third of 1%. One well, more to tell you about. I know some viewers are interested in this. The price of Bitcoin, that's gone above $60,000 this afternoon for the first time since November 2021. Well, joining me now is Toby Gibb. He's Head of Investment Solutions at Artemis. Toby, good to see you. Good Let's see you. start with uh, St James's Place, because this is a massive story in the market today. What did you make of what they said? Yeah, I think, well, I think the big surprise really has been the size of the provision that they've made. So, um, you yeah, know, very significant provision they've made for um, complaints and, and refunds to, to customers. Um, and then also the, the, the huge share price reaction that we've seen, um, we've seen today to, to the results. So, you know, dividends has been cut and earnings, of, earnings forecasts for, um, for this year have been cut. But I think, yeah, really the focus has been on that, that provision. Um, I think that you know the, the cause of that is is not unexpected. You know we've the, the company's been under um, you know pressure from a regulatory perspective for for a little time. Um, the FCA is very much focused on on you know consumer duty and and, and really trying to um, you know make sure that um, that wealth managers across the industry are providing um, providing value to, to their customers. Um, but I, I guess you know what, what I think we can say is that it's not. It's not unusual for a new C an incoming CEO at the first um, sort of earnings um, announcement to, you know, to, to really try to reset things um, and set the company off on you know, a, a sort of a, a, good, a good point for, um, for future growth. And that seems to be what the CEO has done today. And, and certainly in the um, earnings call, you know, he made it quite clear that that was, the, that was the focus. Yes, very much the reset guy, Mr Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Now, um, elsewhere in the FTSE today, really disappointing update from Reckitt. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, pretty weak across the board. Um, so, you know, all of the divisions have been um, have been pretty weak. Um, yeah, real um, disappointment in the the baby food business, um, also in in the sort of medicines business. So, they they say there's been a, a weak cold and flu um, season. Although I, I I've had quite a lot of cold and flu this <laughs> uh, th th this winter. Um, but then the other sort of big news, I think, and, and the big cause of the share price reaction was um, a an issue in the Middle East. Um, so in in Dubai, I think it was some um, that there were some um, discounts that were given to retailers there that weren't reported, and then they were picked up in the end of year accounts, um, and not a very significant part of the um, the total business. But I think the the issue has been more around um, sort of you know the the credibility of management for not not sort of noticing that at the time. So that that's been the 
um, the cause, I think, of the big share price reaction today. Mm, now, we've had another bid in the uh, FTSE 250. I mean, it's been quite a year so far. I mean, we've had bids for Curry's, we've had a takeover of Red Row, yeah. and now a bit approach for Direct Line this afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, a, quite a significant premium offered um, by Aegeus for, for Direct Line, so for, uh, upwards of 40%. Yeah. Um, direct Line, as, as we've heard, have, have, um, have, have rejected the offer. Um, but I think, you know, what... Yeah, the, the sort of share price reaction suggests that, you know, maybe the market thinks that, that they could, could come in with something higher. Um, I think it is, you know, as you say, there have been quite a number of, of bids this year. And, and I think that really does show the, the amount of value that's available in the UK stock market. So, you know, we, we've had a number of reasons why maybe um, share prices in the UK have been under pressure. Um, but actually, there's now a huge amount of value, and we're starting to see that recognised by, you know, by trade, trade buyers in particular um, in the UK, you know, with, with Barrett and, and Red Row, but also, um, also from outside of the UK. And I think that, that could well continue. Yeah, meanwhile, Halford's uh, stock price is off a cliff today. I mean, potentially, does that make them a takeover target? I think it, I think it could well do. Um, I mean, what, what we've seen with Halford's is... I mean, yeah, retailers often often blame the weather for, for poor trading statements, and, and that has been the case the case here. So, um, milder and wetter um, weather. So the milder wetter mild, milder weather means less cars breaking down. The wetter weather means less people buying bikes and, and, and going out. But also, I think there's a little bit more to it than that because you've you've got uh, quite a lot of competition from from Evans that that um, Fraser Group bought, and, and also Wiggle going into administration. So heavy discounting there. Um, but I think, you know, the, the big sort of fall in the share price could, as you say, could, could put it in play. OK, Toby, got to leave it there. Great to have you with us this afternoon. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. That's it for me for today. I'm back at half past 11 tomorrow morning for the next edition of Business Live. Hope very much to see you then. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Coming up after this short break, Matt Barbette is up with the news hour. Thanks for joining me today. Cheerio.